I'm Andres Kelrud. I'm a gastroenterologist with a strong interest in the pancreas and diseases of the pancreas. And I worked in gastro health in Miami, Florida. I also worked at the Miami Cancer Institute, South Florida Baptist System. I'm Dr. Steve Friedman. I'm professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, also director of the Pancreas Center at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. My areas of interest are in pancreatic disease, especially pancreatitis, as well as cystic fibrosis. Andreas, can you give us a little bit of background about what is FCS and how does this relate to other causes of high triglyceride-related pancreatitis? So that's a very good question. Familial calomacronemia syndrome, it's a rare disorder that triggers, among others, acute pancreatitis. And this condition is characterized by very high elevations of triacylglycerides. One of the main issues, one of the main uh, hallmarks of this condition is that these patients get treated, they do take their medication, and despite doing so, the triacylglyceride levels continue to be very, very high. And I guess we uh, starting to learn more about what leads to these very high triglycerides that uh, in familial chylomicronemia syndrome. Can you just tell us a little bit more? Do we know the enzyme or do we know what genes? Because that would help in diagnosing this in our patients. Yes, this is a disease that basically happens in patients that they inherited a mutation from mom and dad that basically these patients do not produce enough of an enzyme called LPL. And uh, this enzyme is the one that is in charge of clearing the chylomicrons that are full of triacylglycerides so they can be used in different tissues in the body. You don't have this LPL enzyme, patients are gonna develop very, very high elevation of the triacylglyceride levels. LPL deficiency accounts for approximately 90, 95% of these patients, but there's at least another five or six mutations that are commercially available. We know now that there's almost 100 mutations that may also lead to this rare condition. And I guess the issue in patients with familial chylomicronemia syndrome is that whatever fats they take in, they absorb it, but they just can't break it down. So you just have these very high levels circulating in the blood, and that can cause sludging, kind of schmutz into the blood vessel system and the pancreas. And that's one mechanism leading to pancreatitis. Another mechanism is that it may play a role in affecting these called fatty acids, these products of the fats that if generated, turn out to also cause inflammation. How does this relate, FCS, to just all comers who have high triglycerides? What I see with my patients is that frequently the doctors don't think about this condition because it's very rare. We know that elevation in the triacylglycerides account for, it's a third cause actually, of acute pancreatitis. So it's very frequent. But within this group, a small subset will have this condition called familial calomacronemia syndrome. I think that one of the things that we need to do when we're thinking and approaching these patients it's to make sure that they don't have, for example, diabetes that frequently goes along with very elevated triacylglycerides. Patients that consume too much alcohol also will have, may have a very much elevation in the triacylglyceride levels. And it's very important always to ask what type of medications they're taking because there's many medications that are known to increase the levels of triacylglycerides. So when we're approaching these patients, we have to think about all of the etiologies, all of the reasons why these patients may develop a high triacylglyceride levels. When you ruled out the most common things, you know, that's when you start to think about this condition. And uh, I think it's the experience of most of us, uh, and it's one of the criterias to make the diagnosis, is that these patients try to stick to a very restricted, low-fat diet they're taking the medications, and despite so, the triacylglyceride levels continue to be very, very high. And they continue to be very symptomatic, and among others, they continue to develop pancreatitis. So it's called familial 
hylomicronemia syndrome. So familiar would suggest that it's in families. So would mom or dad have this, or would it be my siblings, my brother or sister, or how, do, how does that kind of tell us is, is, uh, who would get this disease in a family? I think that that's one of the reasons why it's so important to have a geneticist or a genetic counselor with you in clinic, particularly when you're seeing these type of patients with genetic conditions, for somebody to take the time and explain the patients why most of the times the parents don't have the disease that are carriers. So they have one mutation in their genes, mom and dad get together, and then they have their children, and they're gonna have one in four chances of developing one of the offsprings, one of the kids, developing the disease. So it's called familial, but despite being a familial disease, that rarely you see it in multiple family members as other familial conditions that it's very important to understand that point. So if I'm someone who presented to the hospital with acute pancreatitis and my triglycerides were well over 1,000, we know 1,000 is that trigger point where your risk of pancreatitis goes up when your triglycerides are that high or above. So how would I sort out if I have familial chylomicronemia syndrome? Because you mentioned there's this LPL, this lipoprotein lipase deficiency. There's a lot of different mutations. So how is that diagnosis made, and, and how can I work with my physician and my team to, to get that diagnosis or not? First things being first, we have to rule out common conditions that lead to elevation of triacylglycerides. So we need to start by making sure the patient is not a diabetic. We need to make sure the patient is not taking any new medications. And once you have ruled out other conditions, there are systemic diseases also that lead to elevation in the triacylglycerides. Once all of that is ruled out, that's when we start to think about this condition that it's not as common. How do we make the final diagnosis? It's by checking genetic testing, sending either saliva to get the a genetic testing performed or blood. So is this a diagnosis that mostly is based on clinical decision making oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and we really don't have definitive tools like commercially available genetic testing or measuring that enzyme, mm -hmm. is, uh, that is not commercially available. So when we have genetic testing and it shows that there's some mutation, that's very helpful and uh, of course it's welcome. I think most of the patients also appreciate knowing exactly what's going on in their bodies that it's leading to the disease. I think that the reality is different. Not always genetic testing is uh, available. It's also relatively expensive. It's not always covered by insurance. But most importantly, I think that if you have the clinical suspicion, because you have ruled out other conditions, when you have a patient that is complying with therapy and it's not responding to treatment, when you have a patient that is in a low-fat diet and despite so, the levels of triacylglycerides continue to be very high, to me that's going to be familial calomicronemia syndrome, even if the genetic testing is negative.